G'day everyone, welcome to Animal Tales with Tim Faulkner. Today I'm talking about a subject rather than a particular animal. It'll include wildlife, but I want to talk to you about bushfires. Bushfires are a natural part of Australia's history. We're a continent that has always burnt, but the way in which we burnt has varied from natural lightning struck fires to indigenous folk fire stick farming and burning lands that they inhabit to nowadays where maybe the management's different, maybe the climate's changing, but the recent fires that we just saw were catastrophic. Many of them canopy fires, and that is not how our bush has naturally burned. Can you imagine that the figure and loss of animals is over a billion? Just think about that, a billion animals were burnt in these recent fires. Now, the problem with that and the intensity of the fires is that you think going back through history, when fires burnt, sure, some of them might have raged, but there was always habitat next door and animals would always repopulate the burnt areas and the fires tended to be not of the same intensity. Now that means that they wouldn't have reached the canopy. They didn't burn so hot but the fires we saw did. And one of the problems is that we've now got so much land that's been cleared for agriculture or where we live, but the places that exist are, are our national parks. So if one national park burns and it's not connected to other national parks, how did the animals repopulate? Where did they come from? Because a long time ago, they just move in from next door but they can't now and it's a real problem. So if we lose a population that goes locally extinct, maybe it's our job that we have to help repopulate that with animals. What's needed? Fires are really scary. You know, a flood can come through and a flood can do a lot of damage, you know, rip up trees and some animals might lose their lives, but the flood tends to come and go. Fires leave a really nasty scar, and when they burn, they leave very few survivors. Now, in the recent fires, we saw an incredible uh, intervention effort by organizations like WIRES. So they go out and they travel the front lines of the fire, and they look for injured animals that they can rescue, rehab, and try and release. The reality is that there's not that many animals that survive. The ones that do, lucky for them, and they get great care. But now it comes back to the bush. Can it recover? And remember, as a part of that recovery, it's also not like it used to be. So you've now got a feral fox and a feral cat, and feral horses and feral pigs and feral goats and feral rabbits and feral hares and feral rats. And they outcompete our natives. So while our natives are trying to move back into burnt bush, they've also got the feral predators. And they're exposed because the bush is so much more open because it's been burnt. But the Australian bush is resilient, and it will come back. But my worry is that how it used to be 500 years ago is not how it was when I was a kid. And if you're a kid now and you're watching this, how it is now might not be like that when you're an adult. And so I see it as our job to have to try and bring it back to what it was. Now, when you have a catastrophic fire burn through and it's much hotter than normal. And, and let's just talk about that. What's the problem with a really intense fire? Well, it annihilates everything. It burns and kills the trees right up to the top. It burns all the animal homes, the hollow logs. It burns all of the food, the grasses to the bushes to the trees. Now, a low intensity fire, which is what Australia has been used to for all of history, a low intensity fire burns through. It might even create hollow logs because it's not so hot. It might burn the middle of the log, but not the whole log. It leaves plants to reshoot and regrow, and it doesn't burn the big tops of the eucalypt forest. Now, again, the point of that is the problem with high intensity fires is that it annihilates the bush. So when the bush tries to recover, it will shoot out the eucalyptus trees. We see epicormic growth. It's like the tree's last lifeline. And it's when after a fire, you see the tree bushes out from its trunk. And those leaves are so toxic that koalas can't even eat them. So while it looks like the forest is regrowing, and it is in parts, how can we be sure that the animals are a part of that picture? I want to give you one example. I've talked about lots of man-made effect on bushfires. Are we managing forests properly? Are we backburning properly? Um, are there buffer zones in place to stop the fires reaching areas like Montane Swamp and Antarctic beach forests that have never burnt for all of history? 
But I want to give you one natural example of something that's missing. Now, Australia has the worst mammal extinction rate on Earth. Can you believe that 40, nearly 40, of our little marsupials and native rodents, little kangaroos, have gone extinct? And remember, the thing about extinction is it's permanent. They're gone forever. Now, some species aren't extinct, but their populations have radically decreased. And three that I want to give you on this example are betongs, a small kangaroo, bandicoots, a little native marsupial, and potaroos. Now, those three species have something in common, and they're what's called little ecosystem terrestrial engineers. That's right, they're engineers. And what does that mean? So do you know that a bandicoot, every night it digs in the ground? And a bandicoot is omnivorous. It looks for little grubs. It'll also eat bits of plant and flowers and fresh shoots, but it digs and looks for grubs. Potaroos dig a little bit deeper, and they look for mushrooms, truffles, and fungies. And bedongs will eat low parts of the plants. They'll let more light through to the forest floor. Now, what this means with all of them doing that, and a bandicoot can dig an elephant's worth of dirt every year. Think about how much that is, every little hole of these. So what the three of them have in common and why they're engineers is that they all impact the forest floor by turning the leaf litter over. They're helping the decomposition. They're turning leaves to dirt. What's that got to do with fire? It, fire typically doesn't burn dirt. It burns the leaves and sticks and bark. If the bandicoot is turning the bark and leaves and sticks into dirt, it's reducing the fire load the fuel for the fire. Now, not only do they reduce fire load, but while they're digging, they're spreading seeds of the forest. They're oxygenating the soil, and they're really important. And guess what? They're largely missing from our East Coast forests. They're species that are in the critical weight range. That means they weigh less than five kilos, and that means they're normally food for the feral fox and the feral cat. So, if we could bring back our ecosystem terrestrial engineers to our forests, we could help the impact of fires. Two bits of homework for today. Now, one is fires are also important. Catastrophic fires like we had are too hot, too intense, and they're very bad for the environment. But fires at low intensity have been a part of the Australian bush forever. And in actual fact, a lot of our plants need them. Your homework is to tell me why. Why do some Australian plants need fire? Now, the next thing I'd like you to show me is epicormic growth. I mentioned it, what is it? Why does a eucalyptus tree shoot out epicormic growth? Draw me a little picture. Show me what epicormic growth is and tell me how it works and why after a fire do trees shoot out with epicormic growth? Now, that's all today, see you next time. Thanks for watching everyone. Now, the keepers and I are looking after all of our animals and our families, but we all have a bit of extra time at the moment, like you probably do too. So this is a great distraction for us and hopefully you. Uh, if you like what you've seen or want to show me your homework, just put it into the comments. Uh, this is what I do, connecting people with nature and that can't stop. I'll see you next time.